Thank you, everyone, for joining tonight's uh, Business of Aesthetics podcast. We're really excited uh, today to have a, a good friend of mine, Dr. Judah Garfinkel, occasional uh, golfing partner. And um, Judah and I actually met each other at summer camp, I think, in middle school age is what they would call that now. Like maybe is that a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, something like that. Um, has a terrific practice here in Portland, Oregon, and um, uh, we're excited to have you. Good evening, Dr. Garfinkel. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Super fun. Yeah, I don't know what year it was, but you look exactly the same as uh, the day I met you. <laughs> Thank you. You do too. Uh, so, you know, the, the evolution of this, I mean, granted, we're, we're, we're friends, um, and I think we share a lot of interests. Uh, certainly business is one of those. You really, I know, uh, approach your um, practice as a business person and as much as um, a doctor. I know your, your patients come first and that must be a limitation. Um, but I, I always love having just practice related conversations with you because it's, it's a different perspective, but people are people and, you know, medical practices are still medical practices. Uh, so, but in throughout some of those conversations and maybe in the golf cart, I know we've come up with a lot of similarities, even in patients. And I thought to invite you onto the podcast because your approach to patients is different than what I know in the aesthetics world. And I think that um, we haven't in aesthetics maybe thought about things I'm going to say now only because I've talked to you, but like jaw, uh, you know, the jaw position or really looking at the teeth. I know some aesthetic practices maybe do teeth whitening. Um, a lot of aesthetic practices do lip filler um, or, and some do, do Botox for the, the, the gum area, which I know we'll talk about today, but that's it for us. You know, we're really not thinking about things kind of the way um, you have. So I know um, locally you've developed relationships with a number of different physicians, just, um, but I know at the uh, uh, Thrive Portland, Dr. Maddox refers patients to you when he, he sees mouth and structural things that he's just not going to be able to fix on his own. So that's really the, the, purpose of our conversation um, tonight. And um, thank you again for being here. I'm just going to jump in quickly. And, and uh, I know you are a proud Oregon duck because we've gone to duck games together. And uh, so that's where it's your, your uh, uh, academic, post high school academic career started. It all launched from there. And then you were off to Boston for medical school or for a, a, a dental school at Harvard. And then remind me, oh, then you went uh, to uh, Kentucky. Oh, no. Was it Kentucky next? Yeah. So big blue. That's right. UK. Okay. And UK is the, uh, okay. what, what's, and Univer uh, University of Kentucky was uh, orthodontic school. Yeah. Wildcats did my uh, orthodontic residency there. Okay, and then off to New York. Yeah, to NYU for a uh, craniofacial orthodontic fellowship. Okay, and that, I guess we'll learn more about the craniofacial side of uh, what you do today. So just a little bit more about you. I, I, you really have two jobs that you go to work to, it seems like. I, I hear you going to the hospital, which is Oregon Health Sciences University, quite a bit, and then you're going to your private practice here in Portland. Yeah, yeah. So on uh, uh, every Monday, I, I go to, I'm the director of craniofacial orthodontics at uh, Dornbecker's Children's Hospital at OHSU, where I'm a, a member of the, the, the craniofacial and cleft palate team. Uh, I treat infants with cleft lip and palate with a technique uh, called nasoalveolar molding, where a little a little baby denture and a wire uh, wire nasal stent uh, repositions the gums in the nose 
uh, prior to the primary lip surgery to help it come out better. And then I'm seeing kids around the age of bone grafting and around jaw surgery. So that's, that's Mondays. And then um, the rest of the week, I'm at my um, you know, community orthodontic office where I'm seeing uh, you know, kids, teens, and adults. Probably 30% of my office is, is an adult, uh, adult practice. And um, it's great. It's a real great balance. Um, you know, real, real, real busy, but I enjoy, I enjoy being busy. And, um, and I'm, I'm currently uh, really into to clear liner treatments. And the, the, right now our practice is a, the largest clear liner practice in the state. So um, we're getting a lot of good experience uh, offering patients that. Is that, what are the brands that people know? Um, Invisalign's the the big one, um, and and then there are you know now probably fifty of them. I mean, it's really been a, a, a wow. big flood. Uh, and the largest direct to consumer one is Smile Direct Club. Um, okay, where, um, but the, if I, if I'm needing something like that, and I go to a specialist like you, you're of the fifty that are available. I'm assuming you like certain ones from this company, and for this type of situation, you may like a different one, or is does one company kind of make the the line that you need? You know, they're they they are just tools. That's why I say a, a clear aligner. But um, you know, I think Invisalign right now is a superior material and superior software. Okay. Um, but probably within my my practice career, I'll be printing them out in my own office. I would imagine at some point. Wow. Okay. That's so weird. the the, the teeth don't really care, you know, and you know they just you just gotta apply the force in an efficient way and make it comfortable and right right it's exciting times so uh i know in in on the line of keeping yourself busy i know with the cleft palate specifically um you're uh have run an organization here called smile oregon or i know you you and your, your wife Allie have been super in, involved with that and you have a team of other people that are in, involved in that but um Will you just talk about Smile Oregon, and then is it is it a larger or organization uh, beyond Oregon? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a, a labor of love. And uh, I, when I moved back here in '07, um, I, I had come from NYU, and they had a foundation there that allowed them to take all comers, um, regardless of their ability to pay. And so, you know, my in my heart, I figured when I'd retire, I'd end up, you know figuring something like that out. But right when I moved here, um, a, a retired businessman contacted me and we sat down and for lunch and kept meeting every month. And we came up with, with Smile Oregon in, in 2008. So it's a, uh, instead of a nonprofit, I'm trying to say a, a four impact organization that um, ensures that every, every child and family living in Oregon has access to the coordinated care that they deserve by providing support, awareness, and education. And uh, we, we has hired our, our first uh, employee um, now going on two years. And, um, you know, we impact um, hundreds, if not thousands of lives every year um, within the state. So it's still just within Oregon, but um, it's certainly a model. People have reached out to us to discuss and, and be happy to help um, spread the similar infrastructure to really, really any, any state that has it can identify the need for it. Awesome. Well, I know uh, I talk myself with families here in Oregon that have told me, you know, the impact that that surgery made for their child and on their family. And it's it's uh, it's a I'm thrilled that you're doing it and, and proud to be able to walk with my family and do those types of programs when when you guys offer them. So, yeah, thanks for your support. Yeah, you and Thrive have supported uh, Smile Oregon quite a bit. Well, thank you. If you uh, if people want to learn more about Smile Oregon, how should they do that? Yeah, smileoregon.org, um, or certainly reach out to me. Maybe we'll provide some contact information at the Great. end of it. Yeah, we'll do that, and then we'll we'll make it available. So let let's go back. Um, let's go back to our golf cart conversation for for a second. And I know people are coming to us. Um, in a lot of ways to feel better about themselves, feel better about the way they look in, in your case, certainly there's, I'm sure medical implications of a lot of what you do, but a, a lot of it from the patient side of it, the, you know, their barometer is the mirror. 
So I think we're both in some ways be- beholden to that. And you say it differently than I do, but I, th- uh, I can't remember how you say it, but we say realistic patient expectations. Um, what, and what you say uh, shared definition of success is mm-hmm. what I think you call it. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about that because we, it's similar, right? It's, it's creating realistic expectations or coming up with a, a, um, a plan that your patient agrees with that in the end, everyone's going to be happy with, right? That, that's, that's absolutely right. I think it's, it's nice, to, interesting to hear another term for it. Um, but people will come in, um, you know, often the kids getting dragged in by their ear, by their parent, <laughs> or someone coming in. And, and, and for me, it's, it's um, well, I don't really need it, do I? you know, they told me I needed braces. And, and um, you, you, you know, I've had an evolution in, in, in my career of, of how that conversation goes. But, you know, right now, um, you, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I went through a, a re, rehashing my vision, mission, and values and, and, and doing a lot of work on myself and the practice. And, you know, my guiding principle and, and, and light right now is, is crafting smiles that elevate the spirit. And it's, it's very freeing to me emotionally. I don't need to convince anyone of anything. Mm. If, I, if I don't have the opportunity to elevate someone's spirit, then I don't have anything for them. Mm. And, um, and, and sometimes it's just finding the right services that, that might be appropriate for them. And it might not be in my office, but if it is, then I'm going to be excited about it. And so it's, you know, it's identifying a problem list and, um, and, and educating them about it. And then talking about what, what can be done within my office alone um, or with other providers. And I think that's also where some of this conversation came from is, you know, how can we each as experts, we know what we can do. How can we learn a little bit more about what each other does um, ultimately to help um, elevate our parent, our, our patient spirits? It's, I mean, it, it's the language that we use is different, but the sentiment is exactly uh, the same. And I, I love what you um, said right there about elevating the, the human spirit. And then that, that allows you how freeing that is. I, I did a podcast, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago called um, educating, uh, not selling, because I have a lot of physicians will say to me when, you know, especially in the aesthetic world or when it's a, a fee for service or, you know, an elective procedure say, I, I, I really, I'm not good at selling procedures. I don't like selling the patient and that, you know, you do feel like you're selling if you're selling, but when you're educating a lot, you know, laying out uh, the solutions for a patient and just putting it out there to the best of your ability and then having that conversation with the patient, you don't feel as much like you're selling. You're doing your job, which is providing the best information you can. And then, you know, you come up with a plan from there. Yeah, that's, that's uh it's exactly the, the, the same thing. And, you know, I know I've done a good job when, when, you know, I keep asking them, do you have any more questions for me? Do you have any more clinical parts of the questions before I hand things off? Um, I, I never really get into fees. And when they start asking me, when can they start and how much it costs? You know, I know I've done a good job and that feels mm-hmm. really good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm usually putting people off, you know, either waiting for teeth or we first have to do work on your gums or you first need to go get this consult and you, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's very freeing and refreshing. And I think I just read a quote today saying, bigger's not better, but being better will help you get bigger. And, um, and in another way, that's a kind of another way of saying what we're saying, you know, by, by, being a resource and providing a valuable service, the, re- the, the rest will take care of itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's, let's jump in. I mean, let's jump into, I, I want to, ultimately I want to get to when a aesthetic provider needs to partner with physicians like you or, you know, that kind of stuff. But I want to start with, just your approach to the the face and the mouth and how you 
um, evaluate things? When, when do you look at something being kind of cosmetic aesthetic and when is that plastic surgery or orthodontia or, um, you know, maybe a, a injectable specialist, something like this? Yeah. Um, I mean, in my mind, I would think we all have the same or similar training and look at a patient in the same way. And, um, but, but I think we all, you know, I, I think there might be different differences in terms of terminology and, you know, I think it's great to flesh that out. Um, but when a patient comes to me, I want to make, I want to make sure that, you know, again, that definition of success and, it, you know, and sometimes they're in the wrong office, you know, they've either got jaw pain and, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in my practice doing that, or, you know, they really need to be seen by different provider. So, um, but, but, but how I see a patient um, is, is the whole patient, right? So we're all checking health histories, you know, we'll get past that. And, um, and then my, my exam, um, a, a nice way to think about it is, is um, kind of macro level, big picture, um, mini, which is slightly smaller, and then, and then micro, which is really zoomed in. So, so the macro view is, is looking at the whole face. It's a gestalt, you know, um, and it's tough because faces are normally in, are, are dynamic. We are all asymmetric to a degree. And then there's a, there's a point that that asymmetry becomes either a patient's concern or a functional concern. But we're all, you know, asymmetric. So we're looking at the face totally from the front. We got the facial thirds. There's a number of ways you can slice the face up and everyone's got their own ways to do that. From the frontal view, from the profile view, vertically, sagittally, where the ears are, the uh, inferior border of the mandible, uh, canting of the commissures, you know, eyes, commissures, um, chin, chin throat, you know, point. I mean, the whole thing, right? Because they don't want straight teeth. Someone doesn't come in, they don't want Botox. What they want is to look better, right? They want the better. They don't want the product. If they're asking for the product, that's a little scary because they're not the doctor. Mm. So, you, you know, so that's the big picture, the facial, that's macro. Where are we with that? Then the um, mini, you know, zoom in a little bit, and then it's just the lips and the mouth. So, when they smile, what's the, what's the lip? What's the smile line look like? You know, are the upper incisors on the lower on the lower lip? Um, is it consonant? Is it flat? Is it a reverse smile line? Uh, how many millimeters of incisal show at rest do you see? How much of the tooth is sticking out under the upper lip? When they smile, do we see any gingiva? Um, are their buccal corridors filled or not? Um, and you, you know the, those types of smile dynamics. And then you zoom in even further into the micro aesthetics. And then it's tooth shape, tooth color, gingival embrasures, those little black triangles that can be in between teeth, um, recession, um, and, and, and some of those, and some of those uh, more finer, finer details. So, you know, I collect kind of all that info and, um, you know, jog it around in the brain and, and share it with them in, in ways that, that um, they're able to access. And then um, start talking about which of these things we need to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's a number of them that, you know, it's important we all know what our own tools do and what they don't do. And we're all probably good at sharing um, those issues. And, um, and then finding if it's something that I can deal with in, in the vacuum of my own office or if it's going to be an interdisciplinary case uh, and require other providers to have a seat at the table to uh, work together to, to achieve success. So, I mean, let, let's back up a little bit. We, uh, you, you mentioned it, we, I think a lot of aesthetic providers do look at the face in thirds um, and think about that way from a frontal view and from a, a treatment plan. Um, so to speak, we're specifically for purposes of today, I guess, you know, really focused on the bottom third, um, which, you know, I never, I, I always thought about the jaw line, but I never really thought about the jaw structure until I 
uh, you know, had, had started having conversations with, with you. But so we're really looking at the bottom third of things. And then let's go back to the, the, the mini, I guess. You, you said a number of things like uh, the corridors and, you know, some of the things that we, I, I don't think kind of everyday uh, aesthetic providers are looking at. Certainly, I don't think I see the measuring tape coming out where we're actually using a millimeter measurement to measure the gum line. I know there's a lot of aesthetic product uh, that use uh, uh, providers that use neuromodulators to affect the muscle in the paraoral region. Um, but yeah, can you kind of get into the relevant information for us? Like, are there specific sizes that we should be looking at? Or if it's over a certain size, should we be referring those on? How, how would we know if it's a, a jaw issue versus a, hmm. um, you know, so, something else maybe? Yeah, so I'd say that we can affect the middle and the lower third. So the upper third, you know, the brow to the hairline, I mean, some people are messing with that. That's nothing I'm going to get into um, in terms of certainly moving those bones. But the middle third is the maxilla. So, you know, from the profile view, you know, if you drop a, a plumb bob from the front of your eye, you kind of want it to hit your cheek. Rough, rough estimate. Mm -hmm. If that's too far back, that's kind of a facial concavity. There's not, there's no projection there. Um, or it can be too far forward and affect the nose and the nasolabial angle. Um, and then in the lower third, um, and the, sorry, in the middle third, it can be too short. So when someone smiles, you don't really see any of their teeth. Mm -hmm. or when they smile, you see a lot of gums. Mm -hmm. So that can be relevant in how do we manage excess gingival display, right? You got, you know, sometimes the lip's too dynamic to normal length. Sometimes the lip's too short. Sometimes the maxilla is too long, vertical maxillary excess. And you can mask some of that with relaxing the upper lip, perhaps with, with Botox or, or some other product. Um, or, or we can do some crown lengthening periodontal surgery and remove some gums um, or some orthodontia or orthognathic surgery and impact the entire maxilla superiorly or up. Mm. Um, then in the lower third, you've got um, a lower jaw that can be too far back or retronathic. And that's kind of a class two profile, leaving someone with some extra overbite in front or a too strong of a lower jaw, which would be an underbite. Um, so that's kind of some of that, those big picture things. Um, and trying to bring it home for what might be relevant, I think the gingival display stuff is interesting to have a good, clear diagnosis on. You know, what, when is this, when should we, teeth be moved? When should a bone be moved? When should the gums be moved? When can the lip be addressed? Um, and, and uh, um, I, you know, I had a patient I saw today that um, had, previous implants placed that were the wrong kind in the wrong spot. And they were, um, and she had a, a, a lip that um, elevated a lot and asymmetrically and a canted, uh, a, a lower jaw that grew crooked and the upper jaw grew crooked. So she had to cant. And, um, you know, I think some people had missed the diagnosis on her, but I, but I kind of said, well, geez, what if we did some Botox in your upper lip? You know, have you, have you ever considered that? And, and she looked at me and she's like, well, actually, I'm already doing that in my forehead. And I was like, <laughs> great. You know, let me talk to your provider and see if that would work. You know, I'm not an expert in that, but I think that could really have been a helpful you don't, you don't You don't treat with neuromodulators. You refer. I do them. not. I do not. So, and when you would speak with their uh, injectable person, what would the conversation with the what would that conversation be? Well, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a rare bird as I'm unfortunately figuring it out that I'm a good communicator and I enjoy working with other people. And I often am disappointed that, that people fail to communicate back as much, but I think it's such a great service and it has been an unbelievable, I think, boom to my practice that people know I got their back and I'm going to be an advocate for them. So um, how I'd want that conversation to go is, Hey, I'm Dr. Garfinkel. I had the chance to see Sally. 
Um, and you know, she, she came to me for orthodontic treatment, da, 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 you know, Hey, where'd you go to school? Great. You know, I get to know somebody. Um, I, I really love working with other providers and, um, and then talk about her case and her diagnosis from my perspective and ask for their perspective. And, you know, she probably went in just saying, I didn't like, you know, something else. And, you know, maybe it wasn't even, you, you know, in that individual's realm to like look at the whole face or not you know sometimes patients just ask us to do little things i'm not checking people's you know knees when they come into my office so mm -hmm. um you know and then and then they probably say hey that's a great idea let me get her back in and look and let me see if um that treatment could could help to improve the symmetry of her yeah yeah her so it's thing. not it's not it's 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 more uh, it's handing off care back and forth to each other is is really your your approach there, but when, so when, what prompted you to think that a neuromodulator was there versus, I know we've talked about this. I don't know the, the specific kinds of, of, uh, you know, showing extra gum, but, um, you've mentioned to me in the past, there's, you know, like one kind that, that is what we see and what we're treating the others we really maybe shouldn't be, or maybe I'm confusing that, but. Well, I mean, there's, um, I mean, I, I, I would imagine, um, you, you know, everyone learns the limitations of their own interventions and they don't like to repeat mistakes multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a probably a predictability in an experience and an art and science that come with the use of neuromodulators. Is that a, a fair term to use? So, you know, I know on average I can get three millimeters of something. Sometimes it's only one, sometimes it's five you know, in this kind of lip tonicity, I'm guessing I'm going to get four, you, you know, this is what you could expect. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking about excess gingival display, um, you know, you, you have someone, um, you know, you measure their lip relaxed and you measure the amount of incisor you see um, with their lip just at rest. And then you ask them to smile big, 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 and then you measure how much gin, gingival, gingival display. And, um, you know, and then I think it would be good to also look at their gingival margins, you know, and the gingival margin is the area where the, the, the white part, the crown hits the gums. And ideally, when you look at a smile, the central incisors would be equal, then the laterals a little lower, then the canines at the same height, and then the premolar, premolar, premolar. And if it doesn't look good to you, when you look at there, when, if they don't smile and you can sense that it looks right, then are you really going to get that patient to where they want to be by just providing injectables? Mm -hmm. Or could you share with them the greater diagnosis of some of the things you're seeing in terms of, you know, it's going to still look off. Have you noticed that? Does that bother you or not? No, right. they might not. And that's are, great. Are you saying if they're just looking to drop the upper lip and worried about the ginger, how to say it again for me, gingival, uh, gin, display. gingival display, how much, how much gums they show. So if you're only looking at the gingival display um, as a patient, but then you're as a provider, um, I, I guess if that's the patient's real focus, no, I just, when I smile, I just want to show less gum. Is that, are there cases that, you're saying they should still be referred or just when you're seeing a larger problem that 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 alone won't kind of bring the patient the the end result that uh you think they're looking for from a realistic expectation yeah, it's, more, it's more that second one Re realistic expectations is that the term yeah so you know as long as you're on board and you're like you know all i'm gonna do is drop this lip and everything's still gonna look the same but if the person's like you know i don't love my smile but, yeah. And I feel like I'm too gummy. Well, I can change the amount of gums, but was that really their only problem or was that even the biggest problem? Mm -hmm. um, and, you, you know, I mean, sometimes the answer is probably yes and sometimes it might be no. And so, you know, just kind of having these other, you know, we all have our own lenses, right? So it's just as hopefully this conversation, part of it could just be giving them another set of spectacles to put on when they're, when a patient comes um, you know, referred by who and how come they're sitting in their office? You know, I mean, I think we owe patients a little bit more sometimes than just selling them what they're asking for. Um, but, 
you, you know, putting on other sets of lenses and, and sharing with them, you know, if really what we're talking about is your spirit um, or what are your expectations and have them kind of map it out and they might start looking in the mirror. I hand my patients mirrors, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm looking there, look at it with them. And um, some things I can, I can handle and some things, I mean, I, I would say half my patients have another provider involved. Mm-hmm. And you, top, it top sounds top. like you you oftentimes will invite them to add that additional yeah, provider. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and I guess I, I guess I attract that now, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but I think that's also a little bit more recession proof, you know, in terms of the people that n- need the level of care that I provide. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't get it on the internet. You can't get this type of team care, you know, on the internet. Um, right. you know, as, as, as predictably. So I don't know, but it's also, I, I just feel like it's right. And it's, it's, it's what makes me feel good. No right or wrong. I, uh, I, I love that. I mean, I love that approach. I, so the uh, gingival display, I think I learned a new term today. That's definitely something people are coming in aesthetically and requesting a lot. Um, teeth color is something I think that we get some requests for, um, I'm interested on, on your thoughts on that, but, and then um, obviously alignment so that we, we've somewhat uh, addressed. And then um, what else though? I mean, what else should we be looking at from uh, the jaw perspective or, you know, when, how can we offer our patients more than just what we're offering now in terms of suggestions for total care for them? Yeah, that's great. What other, what other areas? Um, well, you know, I'd really take that from, from you guys. Um, you know, do people come in, you know, feeling their chins back or, um, you know, and sometimes you can put in an implant, but if you, you know, look at the occlusion or the way the teeth fit, there's a very specific pattern that they're supposed to fit in. And, you know, it's called the class one or, um, you know, usually people with their chin being back, it's called a class two. And, you know, the, the other way to fix it is to have a mandibular advancement versus just sticking a, and then you're fixing the, the teeth at the same time as you're, you know, bringing the mandible forward and you're usually opening their airway, which can also be. Wow. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I, cause I would think if, I mean, just if somebody in passing said to me, Hey, who, I, I hate my chin. Who who should I go see? I, I guess I would think about a facial plastic, um, or a plastic, or a otolaryngologist. I but um, but I we should be thinking about an orthodontist too, because if they only go look at as an implant as an option, that may give them a solution, but it may not be the entire solution. It's not all the options, and certainly 90% of people might choose it, or, or 10%. I mean, who, who knows? I mean, I, I offer surgery probably more than any, many others in, in the community, but probably only 5 or 10% of people accept it. And they, they want the compensation or the camouflage, where we'll just use rubber bands or, or this or that. So, you, you know, it's just having the tools in the bag to make sure you've done your due diligence and in, in, in and, and making sure that they have realistic expectations and have been offered offered all the solutions. Um, Are know, plastics on a day-to-day basis looking, if somebody comes in chin related and they're thinking chin implant, are they already referring um, to orthodontists or not, not so much? Or yeah, they're not thinking really, about the jaw so much. I think it's really less specialty and more training. I mean, I know, oral surgeons who are very focused on it, plat, pl- facial plastics, plastics, ENTs, but others within that same specialty didn't get the same, don't look at things the same way. So, um, you know, it's, but, but, but in general, most orthodontists do. Mm-hmm. You, you know, most board certified orthodontists, um, you, you, you know, kind of handle the the, the, the full spectrum of things and, and be able to speak to, to various options. Um, other areas I wonder if we'd overlap would be in, in the, 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 the breadth, the, the wideness of the smile. So when I said buckle corridors, when you smile big, 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 either you look like Julia Roberts, right? And you got 
teeth all the way out to the outside. Or some arches are very square and narrow and just go straight back. And when you smile, there's big black areas. And, um, you know, increasing the width of the upper arch helps to show more teeth when you smile. And, you know, when we do orthodontics, we can bring teeth down a little bit and show more teeth when you smile. And those are things that, um, you, you know, orthodontia is, is one of the only, you know, is, is a great non-surgical anti-aging treatment. And we're rolling back the clock. Teeth move till the day we die in the wrong direction. They wear down and they get flat. If you see flat surfaces in your patient's teeth, that they should have some kind of guard or plastic that protects them. Otherwise, they're just going to keep wearing down. Um, and you know, am, am I making these by putting things in the right place? And I think this is all the structures. You know, we know they look better, they work better, and they and they last longer. And so that's kind of the the idea with the with, with getting the teeth right. Um, lip balance, I think, is something that maybe um, would be some overlap. Um, you know, there's a, a certain pleasing balance between the upper and lower lip. Sometimes people have a lower lip that sticks out too far or an upper lip that sticks out too far. And people are talking about lip fullness. Um, you know, sometimes you got to look, well, where are the teeth underneath these lips? Right. And sometimes there's inadequate support for the lip. The lip itself might actually be adequate. And if it had proper support, then, then you could get that, that lift support you want, or at least su support the, the other treatment that might be indicated. Where filler may give the appearance of solving the problem, there may be a permanent fix through orthodontia for that patient, you're saying. Yeah, or at least to work in combination. And right, and offer even better improvement, yeah, with less product or, or whatever, yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Well, and um, what well, well, just one thing about alignment, um, you know, clear liners are, are totally great in the right hands, you know, and again, it's just um, applying force to teeth, um, but it's really lowered the bar for many adults who, who would not be willing to get braces. Um, in, in my office, we make huge strides in six months. And, and it really br brought the price down to, 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 to a, a point where, where most people um, who are motivated um, but find a real good value in that in a, in a real convenient way. And, um, and incidentally, what made me think about that again is that many report some weight loss. So if, if there's also, uh, you know, various things people are trying to do in terms of, of losing some weight, um, I don't charge extra for any <laughs> weight they might, they might lose during treatment. That very nice. No yeah. extra, yeah. no extra charge, right? Um, that's, uh, I mean, I can just talk to you all day. We, we really do have so much in common. I'd love to talk about business as well. I think uh, I've always said dentists and orthodontists do such a great job with patient engagement, with uh, like the continued follow through and continued engagement with their, their patients. And um, I, I think there are a lot of similarities um, um, even, you know, from the standpoint of how much is covered under insurance and the amount of things that are left elective in our, you know, and, and or, or perceived elective, you know, by an insurance companies and um, so many different things. But I, uh, so here in um, Portland, you have a beautiful practice. I know you, you're, you're doing uh, the full spectrum of orthodontia, in other areas, how, um, how would an aesthetic provider figure out kind of who to build a relationship with, who to, who to refer to? Yeah, I think there are, um, you know, professional partners and, and, you know, everyone's got their own uh, workflow. You know, some people like to, you know, back pre-COVID, some people like to meet in person, some people like a phone call, some people are just emails, some people just want to text. You know, find someone like-minded, but in general, you know, an, an orthodontist who, um, uh, you know, ideally board certified and um, that is willing to return a phone call. If they don't return your phone call, call someone else. That would be my <laughs> guess. And um, I, I don't think that's asking too much. 
Um, but, but if someone is willing to collaborate, a, a lot of these offices, um, and no right or wrong, are, are you know, set up more like factories, where if anything, a different shape comes in, it kind of can cog things up. Um, and, and so, you know, my, my practice is, is intentionally designed to accommodate for individual needs in ideally as efficient way as possible. But um, so, so there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be practices where, um, you know, an orthodontist, I, I would be thrilled for a provider to reach out to me and want to collaborate personally. And I, I can't be the only one in the country. So, um, um, you know, you know, that's great uh, advice. No, it's yeah. great advice in general. I think I was thinking more on the, you know, academic piece or the logistics piece, but you really spoke to the human element. And I, I think that's important if you're really going to work to provide total care for, for a patient. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd also look, I mean, I lead a couple study clubs, you know, I, I give a lot of lectures, you know, there's obviously people slanted towards this stuff that we're, that we're talking about and communicating about it and, and working at a high level. And it takes communication. If you want to be collaborating on something and it's not just going to happen in your office, first of all, you got to charge for it. I mean, it's care that they're not getting anywhere else. And um, you need to somehow, people are going to find value in that. And the ones that do are going to be willing to pay for it. Um, and so, you know, it's finding other like-minded individuals like that and, and forming a study club. Gosh, I'd love to, to do something like that locally. Um, I think that'd be very cool. Yeah, I can see you getting in a big nerd out group and, and loving it. So uh, if uh, locally, uh, Practices I know you know in the Pacific Northwest our, our following is pretty good, um, but if locally providers uh, wanted to get in touch with you or um, what what 's the best way to do that and what 's the best way to have a, a patient reach out to you yeah um, uh, you know my my email um, i 'm pretty responsive to that uh, Judah at garfinkelortho dot com you know do you do you put these up on slides i 'm happy to share this this info. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make it available to everyone. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm also fine sharing my cell phone. I don't think that that many people actually want to talk to me. And um, I, I give it to my patients as well. Um, you know, if I don't know your number, I probably won't pick it up, but I'm going to call you back. And if I don't, then find someone else that will. Um, no, I, I, I really welcome the, that opportunity for sure. Well, great. We'll, we'll make that available. I think it's an incredible... Uh offer uh it also if you have any specific questions or this brought you to uh, specific things you're interested in you know please reach out to us um uh dr garfinkel you're you're i believe uh part of our uh, business of aesthetics facebook uh group i yeah i, th- I mean I've, I've clicked join i'm not sure you've accepted me yet but you should check i think i think i well, think we'll, I, we will definitely double check um yeah, uh, i think we, we certainly have more things in i don't know am i the only dentist in there are there others are there, there we do have we do have a few others you know we have cosmetic dentists i think that really do cross the the gamut but i don't so many of the things you brought up today structurally i mean to 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 look at a chin and think about job placement I and mean, it, it makes total sense. It's just not something that really occurs to us on a day-to-day basis. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, this information with us. I think ultimately it makes us better providers. It makes us more educated providers. You certainly uh, delivered tools for us to um, use in, in our practices and, um, appreciate it so so much i this is really what i was hoping for um as we started to have these conversations i feel uh well i feel smarter almost every time i i speak with you but certainly Likewise. <laughs> um, you're uh you I, I appreciate you doing what you do jeff um and and it seems like the stuff that comes hard to me comes very easy to you in terms of the business side of things the leadership side and just you know off the cuff the all the little pearls um I, i've certainly appreciated and taken to heart and um you know, I, I don't know if the group might be right for you, you know ever post in a case or this or that or how do you manage this or that but you know th- those are all very cool things and i admire you for for putting the, the energy into it and, and thanks for the invitation to this tonight and, and to be part of the group thank you so much i'm i'm I, i'm glad i give that that appearance uh 
so that's a great idea. If you, if you have a, a, a case with a patient that's difficult and you want to post it, uh, we'll make sure we give uh, Dr. Garfinkel permission <laughs> to, 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 to uh, participate in the group. And um, that would be a, a terrific thing. I think there's so many other uh, practices around the country that would benefit from seeing those and, and starting to identify this kind of stuff. So we will post more about uh, uh, Garfinkel Orthodontics, um, the, uh, Dr. Garfinkel's contact information, also uh, smileorgan.org. If you wanted to learn more about that or look at starting a, a local chapter, I can tell you it's, it's made a huge impact on a lot of lives um, here in, in Oregon. So again, Dr. Garfinkel, thank you so much for, for joining us and um, everyone have a good evening. If you uh, uh, can take the time to give us a review or uh, join the Business of Aesthetics Facebook group. Um, reach out to us via email. Go to the uh, businessofaesthetics.org uh, webpage and uh, look at uh, some of the tools that we have available for you. But uh, thank you very much. Everyone have a great evening. Bye-bye.